dark matter, dark energy. I mean, it hasn't really yielded any concrete results for, for decades. That's totally nonsense. Lisa Randall, welcome back to How the Light Gets In. Thank you. So I was once a theoretical physics student, and I remember thinking of it as a kind of magic. I remember when I was um, visiting my professors and the, the floor where the theoretical physicists had their offices, it just felt quite different. It felt like, you know, they were uncovering the deepest secrets of the universe just by thinking about it, just by making thought experiments and mathematics. Is there a gap between how people think about theoretical physics and what theoretical physics actually entails? Well, when I went into theoretical physics, I um, was actually interested in the experimental aspects too. Not that I want to do experiments, not that I want to analyze data, but how could we explain phenomena we actually observe in the world? So actually some of my early work was trying to explain things about the masses of fundamental particles called quarks and also trying to understand properties of what's called charge parity violation. So there were some very um, concrete problems that had to do with measurements that were made. So it is true there are theorists who are more divorced from um, observations, but that's not true of the field as a whole. And the theoretical physicists that do have more contact, as it were, with the experimentalists, I mean, how do they approach sort of devising their, their theories or devising the things that... So I've written, books about, I've written books about precisely these topics because I think there is a kind of false impression of how it's done. Um, but, and to be frank, there's probably no, not a single answer. I mean, but basically you have... So data can be used to test existing theories or it can be used to suggest phenomena that haven't yet been explained by existing theories. And so when these phenomena are observed, they might just trigger some interesting ideas about what are possibilities for what underlie what we know. And then hopefully, if you can make a coherent theory that could explain it, then you can make other predictions by which you could even test these theories and see which one is right, or models in this case. So it's, it's obviously best when you have a nice interaction between theory and experiment. The fact is, at this time, the, the time scale for both sides can be very big for observations more even than, than for theory. And so sometimes it takes a while to catch up. So this is a very idealized view for how things happen, but ultimately that's what we would like to see. I get the sense that, I mean, when in kind of public debates, people talk about theories, you know, this person has a theory, that person has a theory. We, theory gets almost conflated with speculation. You know, people, people speculate about this, that, and the other. But that's probably a little bit unfair to theories when it comes to the context of theoretical physics. Can you tell us about how people should understand the term theory? And I mean, does, does speculation play a big role in it? Well, so basically there's theories that have been established and there are theories which might better be called models for what you think might go beyond that. Um, so for example, the theory of general relativity has been used to make predictions and it just gives you a set of equations for a given setup. And then, you know, how. To, I mean, it's the, basis of modern cosmology, the, that we can explain the expansion of the universe, the other equations of general relativity. So that's a theory that was based on observations, it was based on mathematics, and it's put together in a way that we can make predictions with it. That, that's what we'd like to, a theory to be. Then when we're trying to describe new phenomena or phenomena that are recently observed or phenomena we don't understand, there is, of course, speculation. That's what we do. We have ideas and we don't necessarily say they're right. But there are theories for what can underlie what we've seen. And then you can make predictions about that. So even if it's theory of general relativity, even if you don't change the laws of physics, there might be new ingredients that you have not anticipated. And then you can make predictions with those new ingredients and then test for what those are. So you might call that a model. You might call it a theory if you want to. But ultimately, there's, there is a distinction between the two types of theories. So would you say it's sort of theorizing is speculation that's based on past theories that have had some kind of empirical validation plus making new predictions that then can be tested. Something like that. Something like that. We're trying to use laws of physics. Sometimes we'll come up with new laws of physics. It's not always static, but basically a lot of the time it's building on what's there before, trying to explain what's not yet explained. So in your work, you make this distinction between top-down approaches to theoretical physics versus bottom-up approaches to theoretical physics. Can you tell us 
what the difference between these two are. Um, top down and bottom up. I mean, one is, for example, if if you like string theory, you might have the theory that you call string theory and then derive what the mathematical consequences are. And ultimately, you might try to relate those to what we observe in the world, but there's many, many steps that would come in between. But the other way around is um, you might have phenomena that you observe and try to um, put those together into what might be a theory or a model to explain it, that then you might ultimately tie to principles that are derived from, let's say, at the top. So to go back to this sense of magic that surrounds theoretical physics, I mean, even today, some philosophers and maybe some physicists and maybe the general public that's interested in these things think that you know, physics can answer kind of like our deepest questions about the universe. Um, some people think, for example, the multiverse theory of, in cosmology can explain why life exists, can explain why something exists rather than nothing. Maybe it, ex it can explain the meaning of the universe. Um, this is really jumping around here. Yeah, okay. but do you think physics can answer these sort of like really big fundamental questions or are people putting too much weight on what physics can really do? So not everyone would say the multiverse is ex um, necessarily explaining these things because it's very hard to test any of these ideas. Um, so it's a speculation for what can explain a phenomenon. Um, I mean, I don't necessarily find it useful to say like what do I think physics can do it's like we try things and we see whether we can we can explain things I mean there are certain areas that I won't touch for a while because I don't think I'll be able to explain them in a scientific way and I can make up ideas but some people will so it's a question of what you choose to do on a daily basis too is you're not always thinking about the big question of will we answer this um and so I mean, there are some things that we know, at least with the tools we have at our disposal now, are beyond the realm of, of what we can do in using the scientific method. That doesn't mean it will always be. So I don't want to make grand predictions, but I can make predictions about what I'm going to do in, in my actual research. You mentioned there that things like the multiverse don't really have a, a way of being tested. I mean, if that is the case, do they still belong in the realm of theoretical physics, or is it just now speculation? Is it just sort of I mean, theorizing? I mean... You know, I do believe in academic freedom. People can talk about what they want at some level. But um, but there's only so much you can say. So it's an existence. Of, I mean, it does give a plausible explanation for why um, the dark energy wouldn't be much more than what we've observed. Um, if it was, we wouldn't see. We wouldn't be able to create galaxies. We wouldn't be able to and do we know that that's really a prediction? I mean, it depends what you decide you can predict and what you can't predict. So is it science? Um, I mean, I think it's something that the popular public likes a lot because you don't actually have to understand much science to be able to understand the concept at some level. Um, but would I want all the science to be like that? No. Is it okay to speculate about that? Of course. What do you think makes people think that physics can give us answers to these you know, big questions? Is it is it the predictive power that it has? Is it this idea that it just has its eye on the whole and all of, you know, matter. Is it something else about the allure of these theories? What is it that captures the public imagination when it comes to this stuff? That's a really good question. Um, I mean, I think it might be in some sense the origin of physics um, in people who were um, countering religious viewpoints. Um, but, and it is the fact that we want to ask deep and fundamental questions. But, you know, I joke, I mean, we're not answering the questions that people are asking of religion. I mean, most of the time. I mean, there are times we might prove something that might run in the face of, of religion. But why why do people call on us to answer the big questions? I mean, I sometimes say they should stop doing that. We talked a little bit about how um, this idea of theory or theory in the context of theoretical physics is, is sort of misunderstood. Would you think there's something else that uh, non-scientists, uh, maybe philosophers, or maybe just a general public understanding, misunderstand about the nature of science. I mean, a lot of the time in public discourse, people band about the term, the scientific method, um, you know, which is, you know, once you look at it, far more complicated than, you know, just looking at data or something like that. So what, what do you think is the biggest sort of well, I think misconception probably, out there? I wouldn't say it's necessarily a misconception, but I think the biggest omission often when the scientific method is presented is sort of the fact that there is um, uncertainty. 
that it's, ideas can be disproven, but they can't be proven. But that doesn't mean that we don't know things. It means we know them with a certain degree of, of likelihood. And the fact that there is this uncertainty is very important because it does allow room for things to change. And when things change, that's completely within the context of the scientific method. And sometimes it's just building, and often it's just building on what we had before and adding new ingredients and finding a more fundamental description. So, and But there are other areas of science um, where something is just not developed yet, and it might just be wrong. But that doesn't mean it was bad science. It means that there was uncertainty and there was some likelihood that that theory was wrong, and it was wrong. So, um, and I think, um, you know, we really saw that misconception quite a bit during during the COVID era and people not understanding what what they're being told. And, and in part, it, I mean, it's everyone's fault in some sense because people are afraid to allow for uncertainty because once they do, then it becomes a political tool and people say, oh, well, you don't know what you're doing, it's all wrong. So we have to live in an environment where people can discuss the reality and the subtleties of making progress in ways that allow us to know what we know, but also make definitive progress. And also to, to make sensible um, policy choices. Mm. Do you think the, the mistake, as it were, the sin here lies in the way that science is communicated to a more general public? Or do you think sometimes the scientists themselves treat their th pet theories as, you know, um, Sure, there's a degree of uncertainty, but I'm pretty sure this is right. You know, you, we, we talked earlier. Well, I wrote a whole book the, called Knocking in Heaven's Door to try to explain the way, I, the way I see science advancing. And I don't know that scientists deliberately mislead about this, but it is, um, it is tricky because people are, you know, people are uncomfortable with the notion of uncertainty. People would rather be told, this is the answer, this is what you do. And you say, well... And if you say I'm 95% sure of this, 99% sure of this, um, it, it becomes confusing, not to everyone. So it's in part education's fault because we should, we should learn about statistics. We should learn about probability. And people should understand that. And it's not just, you know, somehow people forget it. I mean, obviously, we're very clear about it in science because we expect so much from science. But look at the statements people make about political situations or other situations. Um, People make very inaccurate statements or statements that are true with some degree of prep, and people are perfectly happy with that. Yet when it comes to science, people want certainty a lot of the time. And so I think we just have to learn how to understand that better and deal with that. How do we, I mean, keep that in mind, though, the, the uncertainty element of some theories with very well-established things? Like, I remember, I can't quite remember which physicist, maybe it was Enrico Fermi, who said something about, like, if your theory contradicts the second law of the thermodynamics, your theory is wrong, you know? Um, so what do we do with these very well-established general relativity you mentioned earlier as being a very well-established theory that we use in cosmology, second law thermodynamics, also very kind of well-established, uh, law of physics. Can we really keep in the back of our minds that these are just, you know, potentially temporary? Well, I mean, if they've been tested in a certain regime of parameters over and over again, um, we probably do believe those theories over that regime. Um, that still doesn't mean it's 100%, but it's very likely. When we go beyond the regime where it's tested, then there's room for the theory to change. Um, if someone finds a result that goes in, that contradicts other results, then something's just wrong, because you can't have a contradiction. One of them is wrong. And so that's the kind of thing you're talking about. And you mentioned earlier the role of science education in, in getting people to understand the kind of nature of science, the sort of uncertainty involved. Do you think there's something wrong about the way people are taught science beyond not sort of necessarily being educated in statistics, that we're mainly taught the results of science and less the kind of process of it? We're taught Newton's laws or we're taught, you know, Maxwell's equations and then we go on to solve problems with them rather than being taught a little bit more about the history of science, how things came about, how did people arrive at certain results and that sort of thing. That's a really interesting point, and I, I don't know the answer. I mean, I don't know if there's time for it. I don't know if people are educated enough to teach it. And, um, and there are certain aspects of the history that are more interesting and more relevant than others. But it is, it is very useful. To, I mean, and that's one of the things I tried to do in my books, too, is to say how people came to the conclusions they came to that it wasn't just something people expected always, but it was necessary to accommodate their putting together things. 
and some people had wrong ideas and some people had right ideas. So that that might be useful. I don't know. Um, many sort of people laud in some ways the process of science, your know, peer review, research grants, all that sort of thing. Others think there's sort of like fundamental problems with the way uh, academic science and academic research takes place today. If if you had to pick one thing about what you would change in the process of how science is done today, whether it be the way it's funded, researched, published, uh, what would you say is the weakest link in that in that equation? I think science has done pretty well. I mean, I think you know, obviously, uh, obviously, especially for experimental science, it takes a lot of money right now. I'd like to see money to support scientific experiments that, that I like. Um, I do think that, um, you know, it, it can distort things if people are better at getting funding than others. Um, I think one of the problems right now we see in my field is that um, federal funding is down, which means private funding has taken over, uh, or not taken over, but is an important aspect. And it's not that private funding is bad per se, but it can distort the kinds of fields that are studied. Um, and I'm not saying that it's a wrong field. It just emphasizes certain fields over others. And they're all, I'm not saying it's not even a valuable field, but it's just, ideally, you would like something that's more egalitarian. What about the way that some research projects uh, or programs become sort of entrenched and become the main kind of paradigm at, at any point and they kind of hoover up most resources whilst, you know, people that might be challenging them are left kind of in the fringes? Is there a solution for that? Um, people challenging them, proving they're right. You know, I think, I mean, it, I think it's one thing to sort of yell, like, we're, we're, we're right, we're right. But it's another if you can actually show that you're right. I mean, one of the projects that you work in, right, Dark Matter, Dark Energy, I mean, it hasn't really yielded any, you know, concrete results for, for decades. That's totally nonsense. I mean, we have lots and lots of evidence for dark matter. It's all consistent. Um, dark energy has been measured in several different ways. Um, what pe what pe we don't know is the precise nature of dark matter, but that's a totally different question. And it's not that surprising that we don't know the nature of dark matter, because by definition, it's something that's hard to literally see. I mean, it doesn't interact with light as far as we know. So we have to be very clever about coming up with ways of finding it. And it does, it's not necessarily something that we will ever be able to discover because it's, you know, we have limited resources and limited ability to test things. So we'll do our best. That's one of the reasons we come up with models. But the existence of dark matter itself, matter that acts the same way as normal matter, but doesn't interact with light, as far as gravity goes, but doesn't interact with light, there's at least eight pieces of evidence that all correspond to it. I mean, as you'll know, people that defend alternatives like Mond argue that, you know, dark matter, dark energy are just postulated entities to just keep making sense of the current uh, physics paradigm. Yeah, I, it's it's actually evolved since then. I don't think modern people even would say that they could eliminate dark matter entirely. I mean, the fact that they can explain one piece of evidence better doesn't mean that it negates all the other ones. So... I mean, there could be something in the dark matter theory that's left out. There could be other things, but it doesn't eliminate dark matter. Lisa Randall, thank you very much.